this is going to be a really exciting session. I'm going to have our, our speakers come sit uh, with me here while I speak and just open up what we'll talk about. Uh, and then we'll also be engaging all of you. So get ready, folks. You know, get, get your coffee, wake up a little. Uh, this should be a lot of fun. Um, we are going to be hearing from three visionaries in education this morning who are helping to reshape the way we think about rights and responsibilities in an age when education is increasingly digital and technologically assisted. So to get started, I do want to prepare you uh, to be part of this conversation. And we're going to do this using technology, uh, using Poll Everywhere. Uh, many of you may have been in sessions in the past where you have been polled using this text messaging technology. Um, so I just want to take just a quick moment to uh, ask you all to literally take out your phones <laughs> and, uh, and just get, a quick, get this set up so that we'll be able to use it as we get into the discussion later. Um, so on this slide, you'll see um, how to just quickly kind of get into the, the polling platform that we'll use. You first um, will just need to send a message to the number 22333. And in the body of your message, just type the word New America 2016. Doesn't have to be all in caps. Uh, you can just be, just make sure you don't put spaces in between it. Um, that'll throw, throw off the system. But just New America 2016, and that will, you should get a message back saying that you are now in the session. So that's, that's it for how we'll use the polling software, um, but I'll get back into that after we hear our speakers. Uh, for those of us who are joining online, you can also participate uh, using any web browser and visiting um, www.pollev.com slash New America 2016. That's P-O-L-L-E-V dot com, New America 2016. Okay, so let me take a moment now to introduce our three speakers this morning. Um, they're each going to talk for a very short time. I've uh, given them a really tough task, which is to take just three minutes to basically introduce everything they've been doing in their lives uh, and, and why they think it's important. Um, and then we're going to sit down for a discussion. So what I'll do right now is just quickly, um, you'll see their, their bios in your, in your program as well. Quick, quickly introduce them. They'll come up one after another. And then all four of us will sit down and have a conversation. So today we have with us Teresa Hardy, directly to my left. She is the Chief Operating Officer at Delaware State University. Teresa is at the forefront of efforts to serve uh, students better using data. And in particular, Delaware State has created a special team of analysts that collect and use data to identify students who may need additional support uh, to graduate on time. So she'll be telling us a lot more about that. After Teresa, we will hear from Vicki Katz who is the associate professor uh, and associate professor at the School of Communication and Information at Rutgers University and a senior fellow at the Joan Gans Cooney Center at Sesame Workshop, which is also a group that we have done um, and partnered with uh, in the education policy program on several projects. Vicki was the co-author of a recent paper, Opportunity for All, question mark, uh, which uses qualitative studies in a national survey to better understand how and if low-income families are really able to gain access to information that they need to thrive and to learn. And then we will have David Wiley, who is the Chief Academic Officer of Lumen Learning. He, uh, that is an organization dedicated to the adoption of open educational resources. David also leads the Open Education Group at Brigham Young University and is the Education Fellow at Creative Commons. He's known worldwide for new thinking around the need for open education. And he'll tell us a little bit more about what that means. So each of these speakers are going to help us tackle the big question that we're posing in this session, which is, what must be included in a next social contract for education in the digital age? And many of you have heard from a video this morning and from many of the discussions yesterday um, that it really is time to revisit this mutual agreement that keeps our society humming. It's supposed to keep government working. Um, with respect to what we expect our institutions and our government to provide 
for us and what we expect of ourselves to provide for each other. And in the education space, this is a really um, key question, right? Because for more than 100 years, we have had a public education system that is based on the idea that children have a right to an education and that in exchange, our tax dollars and our efforts as parents and community members should help enable them to gain access to that public education. So, and throughout the 20th century, this is also of course expanded to higher education as well through provisions such as the GI Bill. So now, here we are, right? We're in 2016, and on top of a myriad number of questions around whether our education systems can even handle the expectations of the 21st century, we also have this influx of technology. So we're in this digital age where we're communicating, learning, and reaching our, where we're communicating, learning, and reaching our full potential has started to look very different. So it's really time to have a conversation about what we want to demand from our educational systems and to talk about upholding some tenets of fairness, ethics, equity, responsibility, and opportunity for all when digital technology comes into the picture. So, you know, just a small, small task. <laughs> um, we're going to get started. Teresa, uh, Vicki, and David, as I said, will speak for three minutes, and uh, I'll let Teresa take it away. Thank you. Thank you. So hopefully, I'm going to stay within my three minutes. It's been difficult mm -hmm. practicing in the bathtub. Just my own. <laughs> I just All right, so good morning. Um, I'm Teresa Hardy from Delaware State University. And Delaware State is a HBCU land-grant um, institution, and we serve, our mission is to serve underrepresented minorities. Delaware is a little different in that we have about a, a, a diverse population. We have about 68% African Americans, 11% white, probably 6 or 7% international, and the rest of uh, others. So we were established in 1891. Um, we just celebrated our 125th year last Sunday. And we're going to celebrate all year long to next May 15th, 2017. And what I'm going to talk about is things that we're doing now to make sure we stay here for another 125 years and serve our student population. So I'm going to flip back and forth between a couple of slides. What we've done at Delaware State is it is our job to make sure if we agree to admit students that they do indeed graduate. Um, gain for employment, do they get jobs, go to the military, whatever the case may be. So <clears throat> what we've done is develop what we call My DSU IDP. And that is every freshman that walks in the door at Delaware State University has a personal advisor, okay? And that person is responsible for the success of Delaware, of that Delaware student. And in that personal, um, advise a development plan, we have student profile, so I know where the student came from, which high school, where they graduate, the GPA, SAT, all the information that a student has when they walk in the door, and then we develop predictive analytics around that, so we can make sure that when a student walks in the door, we have the infrastructure that they need to be successful, based on what we see in their data before they come in. And then once they get here, we track all the academic um, successes or failure. We know if they're first generation, how much debt they have, if they work in second jobs, all that stuff that may impact them completing their degree and what we say is four or less years. Then each advisor has, it's a mandate that they see a student three times a semester. At the start of semester, mid semester, and at the end. And they have to comment on what their conversations are with that particular students, and we use that data then to do a predictive analytic model on engagement. How many times do we really need to see a student to make sure that they are very, uh, successful, or if they got off the path, what was the interventions along the way? And then lastly, there's, there's a couple more size, um, tabs, but the student analytics tab is the best tab in the world, and that tab tells us early alerts. This student didn't come to class, they are making C's on their last two tests, um, they are partying, you know, they got a traditional problem. So it gives us all that information. And again, we throw that into a model that says, okay, 
we got to do some intervention. And what is that in intervention? And do, th did we do it just in time? And after that, we have an advisor analytics, analytics. And that's where we judge, did the advisors do what they said they would do? Did we hold up our end of the deal saying, if you admit it and you do these things, we will do these things. And again, all of this is around predicted analytics. So since I only had three slides, you see I put a whole lot of stuff on the slides, right? Um, so, so not only do they have a My DSU ID, IDP, but they also have a journey map. And this journey map, when a student walks in, here is your journey, okay? So we try to keep them on a journey if they make a shop right. How do we get them back over there? So we, this summer, we're developing both of those things in apps because 98% of our students have telephones. They might not have iPads or computers, but they do have telephones. And all this will be just in time, every day, every minute, where I am in, in my career. So the graph over there to the left is one of my favorites because we're able to predict before they walk, they walk in the door their likelihood of success. And you can see, we can predict, I think, 83% before they walk into the door. And then the beginning of the first semester, 97%, the likelihood that they're going to be successful. And so may, you may not know, I'm also a CFO, CIO, all those COs, uh, whatever. <laughs> I'm sure some, some other letters they probably call me. But these, these last two are my favorites because I am responsible for the money. So what I do is translate all this retention graduation to dollars to make sure we're sustainable. So if you see, if we change nothing else but retention, we will increase our revenue probably about $3 million fairly, fairly easy without changing anything else. And if we have a student take 1.5 more credit hours, they would graduate 60%. We can increase our four-year graduation rate by 60%. And we've been doing that for the last three years. We have gone from 62, when I entered, when I started at Dell State, the retention was 62. It's gone up uh, 1,000 basis points. It is 72 now, and I go next year is 77. So again, we have developed plans for our students to be successful because it is personal for DSU. <laughs> Good morning. No. Well, this is when you know you're an academic, when you can analyze <laughs> the significance of technology you don't know how to use. Um, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, what I want to talk about in my brief time today uh, is to start with something that is no secret to anyone in this room, which is that access to the internet is increasingly being recognized as a necessity rather than as a luxury. And as more opportunities move online, not just for kids, but also for adults, it should be recognized as one of the things that gives people access to the world. Part of the reason we're concerned about this is because there's also growing recognition that social inequality and digital inequality are linked. The people who experience broader and more pervasive forms of social inequality related to housing, education, language proficiency, occupational opportunity, and so forth, are also the ones who are most likely to be underconnected to the internet. That creates fears that digital inequality might exacerbate these broader forms of social inequality, but also provides hope and possible opportunities for mitigating these broader social inequalities with meaningful access to technology. In the education sphere particularly, the time to act is now. A new era began in September of 2014. Kids of color became the majority in American K-12 schools. And approximately 60% of those kids are growing up in low-income families. So there's a few aspects of the challenges to digital equity that I want to highlight today as we're thinking about the next social contract for US education. And they all have to do with what commitments we're willing to make about expanding what it means to have access. The first thing, and it comes out of our study so clearly, is that thinking about access as having the internet or having a device is simply not enough. It's about the quality of your connection. It's about how consistent it is. It's about what you can do with it. So it's not just about hardware. It's not just about the internet. It's about whether you can pay for it. It's about whether you have the supports locally in your community to help you develop the skills that you can meaningfully access the things you want to do in your day. And those things matter tremendously. 
One thing I want to raise for our conversation is that there's a difference between mobile-only access and access on a laptop or a desktop. I'd like everybody in this room to consider the following, which is something that came out of our interviews over and over again. Imagine being in seventh grade and having to do research for a school project on the Hippocratic Oath on a smartphone. You do all your research on mom's phone, now you have to type it up on the smartphone and submit it. That is not equitable access compared with somebody who has access on a desktop or a laptop. So for our lower income families, for families of color who are disproportionately connected through mobile devices, that is not mission accomplished. That's just a first step, and we need to be clear about that. The second thing that I want to add just very, very quickly is um, to think about filtering of content. There was a recent article in The Atlantic that highlighted how internet filtering is disproportionately affecting our lowest income students because if you only access the internet at school or through school uh, provided devices, you're subject to the filters that are consistent on school related technology and the same is true of libraries. Why is filtering a big deal for the next social contract for US education? Because frankly, unless we commit to making the whole internet available to everyone, our efforts towards, di towards digital, digital equity are fruitless. We either make the internet as broadly accessible to all learners as possible, or we will inevitably create a two-tiered system where the poor get a narrower set of resources and opportunities than the wealthy. No matter how good the intentions, a more limited internet is less internet, and that includes efforts like internet.org. We can look to the EU for guidance on this. Researchers there have focused on children and media and helped to shape a policy agenda for protecting children from harm, which is what filters are intended to do. But harm is a narrower conception of online uh, threat than risk. Risk and opportunity are paired. And you can think of that every time you provide your email address to get um, discounts at a favorite store. Mm -hmm. You're sacrificing a little bit of privacy for an opportunity. You're managing harm and risk. You're managing risk and opportunity. We should be teaching all children, rich and poor, how to manage risk, not using filtering and other heavy-handed means to obviate all risk, because doing that also restricts the many opportunities for the kids and parents who are affected by it. Thank you very much. Three minutes. <laughs> All right. I want to frame my remarks today with a quick story. Once upon a time, there's a beautiful valley where people lived. And the valley's full of flowers and grass, and it was beautiful. And people walked most of the places they went until one day a young man invented this uh, amazing device called an automobile. People started driving these automobiles everywhere, and it was incredible. They got from here to there, they went fast. Um, but people started to notice that the automobiles were kind of tearing up the countryside. So the people came together and they said, what can we do? We don't want to give up the benefits of this great new technology, but we don't want to completely destroy the countryside here. So let's make a, uh, let's make a compromise where we'll create these things called roads and we'll make a law that says whether you're a truck or a car or a motorcycle or whatever you are, all the things with engines that go must stay on the road. And if we do that, we can carve out some roads, which will be a bit of a sacrifice, but we can keep the rest of the valley looking very pristine. Well, a couple of decades later, a young woman had another idea for a device that she called an airplane. She was really excited about this. It was going to get us even faster. It had different kinds of maybe lower impacts on the environment. She raised a bunch of money and got together. And at her announcement, uh, the police showed up. And the police wanted her to remind her that even though they're really in favor of this great new device she had invented, to remember the law that says all the things with engines must go on the road. So she was welcome to drive her airplane anywhere she wanted to go, but flying it would be illegal. So what's the point of this little tale? The point is that the internet provides us with a set of amazing technical capabilities things that we could never even dream of doing in the past. But uh, long before the internet even was a gleam in an engineer's eye, there was some law that existed. Copyright law. Copyright law that regulates things like copying, like creating derivative works, like distributing 
copies of works. And when you think about what the internet is, the internet is really a giant sharing machine. It's a machine for making copies, for making derivative works, for making remixes, making mashups, uh, for distributing those around the world instantaneously. And so there's a very profound tension between what copyright enables uh, legally and what the internet enables technically. And in our battle uh, for equity and for quality education, we're kind of fighting with one hand tied behind our back as we are caught in this tension between what we could be capable of doing and what we're permitted to do. Uh, so the idea that I want to talk about today and that we'll explore a little bit further on the panel is the idea of open educational resources. Open educational resources are essentially open source curriculum materials that are one, completely free for anyone to use and access and come with a set of copyright permissions that make it legal for us to do all the things that the internet uh, makes technically possible for us to do. Thank you. So, thank you all very much. Um, I know that my gears are turning with some different questions. Um, hopefully in your minds, your, your gears are as well. Um, so I, I will have some specific ones, um, but I want to take the pulse of the room um, and we're gonna move to our Poll Everywhere uh, platform for a moment and then we'll set up some questions for each of you. Um, so if we can get the first question up on the screen. Um, this is a, a, a pretty basic one, honestly, but wanting to just understand where we all uh, sit on this issue of whether we're worried or excited about what technology means uh, in education. So we're already starting to get some answers in here. For those of you who aren't sure, just all you have to do is basically text A, B, C, or D to answer the question. And we can start to <laughs> see in real time how you all are feeling about this question. Um, and I think that it's one of these things as a parent of middle schoolers using technology every last minute of their lives. My answer on this would change depending on my heart rate as I'm watching my children. So now that they're not around me, maybe I'd probably put uh, both more than worried, although that can change a lot. So okay, it looks like we've got settling in here to understanding that um, among our incredibly unscientific sample, uh, we are now um, seeing that, you know, there obviously are there's a lot of reason to be excited and there's a lot of reason to be concerned. Um, so I want to I want to dig in a little bit more, and I'm gonna I start with with you, Teresa, as you're describing the way Delaware State is using data mm -hmm. to identify students with this very laudable goal of mm -hmm. ensuring that they're graduating on time. You are essentially profiling your students, right? And so so we'll just have to let's, let's talk about this a little bit in terms of. How do we get around this idea of what it means to use data to, to profile and where we need to make sure we go? What kind of bumpers need to be on the, the road as we're going down? So uh, I think profiling was a word I used before and I got beat up at, um, at, at Delaware State. So we call it cohorting now. <laughs> Wait, call it what? Cohorting. Cohorting. <laughs> okay. Put them in cohorts. Um, gotcha. <laughs> and so how we do that is we do mask information because we're only looking at variables and so no one really knows a student but they know cohorting this type of student with this these issues right, and SAT right. GPA whatever the case may be that these are the infrastructures that we need to put in place so very few people know behind the scenes um, um, about these students. These students don't know. They, they have no idea because we make, we have common um, activities across the university and we also have um, activities, what we call, that are unique to them to make sure they, they, they are successful. So. Okay, okay. And are you putting in place specific kind of principles that you and your staff ab abide by as you're looking at the data so to ensure we right, so we have data standards. We have a confidentiality that we have what we call so a data uh, transformation team. And that team meets every Thursday from 3 to midnight. And what we do is talk about midnight. data, midnight. 
Um, and we just kind of focus on our internal data. So um, we have a faculty member, we have a dean, we have institutional research, we have a data scientist, and myself. And that is the core team that is analyzing all this data. So we have that mass where that, you know, there's no issue. So I don't really worry about that. The only thing that probably worries me is that I want to make sure, because this data goes out to advisors, mm -hmm. that the advisors mm -hmm. are confidential in their coaching of each student and what they need to do mm -hmm. to be successful. So just real quick then, if you were answering that poll, A, B, C, or D, where would you be? I probably would say I'm excited mm -hmm. because to be honest, I don't know any other way to get the students but through some method of, of technology, to okay. be honest. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So um, we'll go down the line here, but after that we can kind of mix it up a little bit. Um, Vicki, I know in the, in the research that you've been doing um, with, with Victoria Rideout, who's also a lead author on this report on uh, digital opportunity and equity, you are defining what it means to be underconnected mm -hmm. based on the research that you've done nationally mm -hmm. and that there are certain families that are more underconnected than others. Um, so take a moment to explain that in a little more depth for sure. our, our audience. So since uh, the internet became popularly available in the 90s, we've been governed by this idea that there's a digital divide. Right, that there are people who have and people who are have-nots when it comes to the internet and related technologies. And that made sense for the first decade or more that the internet was available. It makes a lot less sense now that we're still using it. Um, and the reason I say it makes less sense is because the vast majority of people who would be considered have-nots, lower income um, folks, young people, people of color, and the combinations of those things, have access. Um, you know, we did a nationally representative survey of parents with, lower income parents with school age kids, 94% of them have an internet connection. 81% have a laptop or a desktop. More than two thirds have a smartphone or a tablet or both. Um, they're not have nots. But when you ask questions that follow up from that about um, whether or not they feel that they have enough time on the device to do all the things they want to, uh, whether their connection's been cut in the last year because they couldn't afford to pay for it or they hit the max on a data plan, a full third of, uh, sorry, a full quarter of them um, are mobile only, right? They don't have connection on a desktop or a laptop. Um, and over a third felt that their connections were too slow. So when you start to layer it against these issues related to quality and consistency of access, we're forwarding the idea that we should be thinking about whether people are more or less connected, whether they're underconnected compared to where they would like to be. And I think that piece is important um, because rather than saying everybody needs to have um, certain things and being prescriptive about it, what do people want for themselves should be what guides us, at least in part. And so the questions we asked them were really designed to get at how connected are you compared to how connected you would like That's to be. So we're forwarding this idea that we should be talking about who is more and less underconnected because it also gives us multiple policy fronts that we can work with to try to address the issues why we have so many families who are underconnected. And that's more than half of the parents we spoke to would, said yes to at least one of those questions. And what's interesting too is that you're basically kind of laying out a spectrum of connectedness mm -hmm. instead of a binary. Exactly right. which Which does feel like much more like real life. Um, so, how would you answer the question? I'm both. Are you on um, both? You're worried? I'm both because uh, I worry about efforts that put technology first and relationships second. Um, I'm worried about putting technology into schools without carefully considering how to bring parents along in ways that support um, the, the efforts of those programs for kids. We interviewed parents in school districts uh, in three states who felt like they'd been disengaged by having um, these initiatives come in too quickly and not enough programs to help parents learn alongside mm -hmm. their kids. Mm -hmm. That they were now sometimes less able to help with homework than they had been when it was on paper. Mm -hmm. um, we shouldn't be forwarding technology at the expense of relationships. Um, but there's tremendous opportunity. I think we need to put relationships first and use technology as tools for deepening those relationships. And I think we'd get a long way by thinking about what kids need to learn and developing curriculum to support that 
and then deciding which technology best support that curriculum instead of bringing in the tech and then saying, now we have them, what do we do with them? Which is how most of the programs get designed. Right. I think there's a lot of room to make great things happen, but I think we need to think carefully about how we're doing it. Yeah. So David, uh, I can start with the, are you excited, concerned, or? Uh, I'm or definitely both. both. You're in the both <laughs> camp. Yeah. And are you, Tell me about being excited for a moment. So when it comes to the ability to share, remix, use new information, what have you been seeing over the, and I know you've been watching what the internet's meant to the sharing of information for, for decades now. What are you seeing that gives you that sense of excitement for students? So I think one of the things that's most exciting to me is the trend now around OER-based degree programs, OER being Open Educational Resources. So uh, most of our work focuses on community colleges um, serving primarily at-risk students, uh, where the cost of textbooks and other educational materials can be as much as half of their total expenditure, can exceed the cost of tuition and fees in the programs that they're in. And OER-based degree programs are programs in which the faculty teaching the general education courses and the required courses substitute expensive materials with openly licensed, freely available materials. That, in, that means that there's day one access for every student, whether their financial aid has come yet or not. Um, our research is showing that it significantly moves the needle on uh, outcomes that we care about, lowering the drop rate, lowering the withdrawal rate, increasing the see or better rate in terms of students' final grades. And that, is, uh, that movement of these OER-based degrees is starting to really gain steam. There are about 20 across the country now. There ought to be about 60 by this time next year. Um, so so that's me, quite encouraging. Let me jump in on one thing you, you just mentioned there, because I think there may be some who recognize the value of open resources for access, but you were just pointing out that they're affecting students' outcomes, their okay. ability to learn. Yeah. Talk, talk about that just for a minute more, because I think that might be surprising to some people. Yeah, well, um, Great research-based materials, which are unaffordable for some portion of students, are also perfectly ineffective for those portions of students. <laughs> and so you have some students who can never afford access. Mm -hmm. And we've done survey work. There's been a bunch of survey work done in different places around the country asking students what the impact of the cost of educational materials is on them. And you see that an overwhelming majority of them have gone at some point without access to, their, to the yeah, textbook yeah. because it was too expensive. But almost a quarter of them regularly go mm. without yeah, access, access to the required materials. Mm -hmm. So when you think as an instructor, you come in the room and you look out and you think mm -hmm. you know, 20, 25 percent of the people who haven't read the assigned reading because they don't have the book. Um, and then there's another portion that have to wait till the second or third week when their financial aid check comes to then go buy the book. And at that time, if you're already underprepared, you're so far behind, there's no way to catch up. The, this issue of access really is tightly connected mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. issues of academic success. Okay. So let's go to our next question for everybody in the room here. Um, and, it's, and it's along the same themes, but um, it's a way to maybe get a sense of where priorities should be um, in terms of these various issues about fairness uh, and what kind of elements we need to be considering. So which is most important to you among these many issues we're talking about here. Data responsibility, uh, data privacy and responsibility, access to high-speed internet in the first place, having access to educators who know how to use technology well, having open access to textbooks and educational materials, or, or something else altogether um, maybe on your minds. And we'll see how things play out here as everyone's putting in their answers. And I should just quickly tell you, if I, if I didn't already, the, the system is pretty good on, on privacy, honestly. We've vetted that, and they're not using your phone numbers in any way other than for this poll. Uh, so just don't have to worry as you, as you put in your, your answers here. Um, so, so it's interesting, actually, to watch this in real time and see yeah. how this is shaking out. Um, and I know that we have several folks here you know, with, with an Open Technology Institute who are working really hard on these privacy issues um, and thinking about data and data responsibility in deep ways. In the education 
um, policy program. We have many of uh, analysts that are working on what it means to be a good educator today and how to make sure they're prepared. So we're seeing a lot of that as well. Okay, so this may change as we're talking, but we'll let these <laughs> results sink in a little bit here. Um, I wanted to just take a moment to then, um, I guess, get your, your take on these responses. Um, as we're kind of seeing, again, what our very unscientific sample is, is thinking is of high importance right now. Um, do any of you have any responses to this just right now off the bat as you're, as you're seeing what's coming in? Anything surprising? The, the access to educators who know technology well um, is a piece I know, Vicki, that, that you've been looking at from a context of educators in a, in a broad sense too, right? Not just um, teachers in classrooms, but also recognizing that children are surrounded by people in their lives who are introducing them to technology in many ways. Um, so and you had said a moment ago that the relationship piece is really key yeah. to you. Do you want to talk a little bit sure. about even the ethno ethnographic research that you've done in terms of what families are sure. experiencing? Um, well, if we're thinking of educators in the narrower sense of teachers, then there are some excellent national studies that have been done recently that show that teachers themselves are feeling a bit ambivalent about what the costs and benefits are and unsure of how to do things. And that's especially true in early education where it's um, still in many spheres anathema to even talk about using technology. Um, so they're really less likely to know how to use it or to feel good about using it or how to use it and so on. Um, but I, my research looks primarily at uh, kids as children and families because they spend far more time there than they do as students in schools. Um, and so I'm interested in what happens at home, especially in homes that we often know less about, lower income and immigrant families. Um, what's happening at home that might be supporting education um, in the classroom or perhaps is supporting it in ways that we are not recognizing or validating, which I think is really important. Um, so the, both in the interviews that we did and in the national survey, bless you, <laughs> um, bo in both, um, we see that there's an incredible amount of um, intergenerational um, engagement around technology, parents teaching children how to learn about and engage with technology, fix problems, find content online, but also the reverse, right? The children in these families are playing roles in helping their parents to adopt technology and engage with it and learn how to use it in a way that they're not fearful about. Um, that was especially true in the interviews that we did with um, 350 parents and kids in three school districts, open-ended interviews with um, kids who are on free or reduced cost lunch and their Mexican heritage parents, um, either immigrant or native born. Um, but we saw the same thing in the survey where we could compare those families' experiences to those of English-speaking, US-born Hispanics, um, African-Americans, and whites. This is happening across the board. Um, mm -hmm. Three quarters of parents have helped their kids learn how to use technology, but over half have received help from their kids. And that's across all income, le all income levels below the median household income. It's across every education level, and it's across all racial and ethnic and language backgrounds. Um, it also affects how, how siblings learn with each other. In homes where um, parents are guiding their kids with technology more than the reverse, siblings are significantly more likely to help each other with homework uh, read with each other or to each other, mm -hmm. and to do arts and science projects together. All three of those are things that might involve technology. They often do, um, but they don't have to. But those are three activities that are validated and recognized by schools as relating to learning in the classroom. In homes where children are the ones guiding what happens with technology at home, those are families where kids are significantly more likely to be teaching each other how to go online um, watching, watching videos to learn together and watching TV to learn together. None of those are forms of learning that get validated in the classroom. They're more likely to be seen by teachers as a waste of time. Yeah. So I think there's some interesting implications mm -hmm. about what teachers validate and what kinds of learning mm -hmm. might occur from the kinds of unstructured um, play that happens and between siblings to learn uh, in various ways. And it feels to me also that it's getting at this point that and David, I'm really curious about your, your take on this, that the model of 
the 20th century, which was you learn from a textbook that mm -hmm. is given to you in your homeroom class or you know, or in your, mm -hmm. in your science class, and then once you close that textbook, you are not learning. Um, but that model's like completely gone out the window, right? But given that we're not necessarily then so reliant on the textbook, does it mean that we, I mean, I, maybe this is a leading question, right? But that we have to <laughs> make sure that those media um, that are not just textbooks are as available as possible to, to students. Um, yes. And, and I guess, <laughs> let, let me ask, surprise, surprise. Let me ask it maybe in a different way. Do you think today's educators and, and families recognize what is not available? Do they know that there are certain things that are just closed off to them or that they're going to have to pay X number of um, dollars or licensing yeah. fees? Are they worried about copyright? I mean, I don't even know how many parents know or yeah, no, there, care. There, there's so many problems wrapped up in that question that you're asking just right off the bat. A lot of kids, uh, a lot of at-risk kids who do manage to get to college have heard about tuition, know about tuition, have saved up for tuition, but textbooks have always been provided to them and they show up there and there's a 100% increase in the cost that, they're, yeah. that they were planning to bear and um, it's, that's traumatic and, mm -hmm. and, and tragic in a range of ways. And, and then there's also, you, know, you talked about the digital divide. I'm, I'm quite interested in the, the daily divide, the gap between our in-class experience mm. and our real world experience where kids are making memes and they're remixing this mm -hmm. picture with this text with this audio and they're involved in all this creative activity and then as soon as they get to school either that's seen as a waste of right. time mm -hmm. it's not validated or you're told you can't use that image that's a copyright violation and um, mm -hmm. you know this mm -hmm. their academia seems to be very good at kind of holding still while the world <laughs> moves further and yeah. further forward yeah. and and yes. that that gap between <laughs> daily life and school life mm -hmm. makes school feel very academic in the sense of like an academic exercise, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so how we make school feel more relevant, which would cause me to actually care about school and engage in mm -hmm. school and be involved in school, um, I think is wrapped up in these issues and as so, well. And so is that an issue of, uh, of equity that needs to be understood in this Next social contract. It, I mean. it, it really does, and I, I want to I want to get on to something that uh, that Teresa was saying too about data. There, there's this idea somehow that uh, that using data in education is some kind of Faustian pact that we make that I'll I'll share my data with you in exchange for some service. But but the the overtone is always that what a stupid thing to do. You should never do that. We should be very very concerned about mm -hmm. privacy, mm -hmm. and we should be concerned about privacy, but. If you went to the doctor and walked into the doctor and said, Doc, my back hurts, and the doctor said, tell me more about that, and I said, I'm not comfortable telling you what I was doing when I hurt it, or exactly where it hurts, um, or how long it's been hurting, or like if I was unwilling to provide right, any right. Mm -hmm. how, how do you treat? How do you treat? <laughs> right? So this, it's this <laughs> idea that there has to be, if we want better service, if we want better support, if we want better outcomes, we need better data. And if you're not comfortable sharing data, that's okay. But you have to understand that you can't get the same level of service if you're not willing to provide some information to the doctor about the nature of your injury and how long and where it hurts and how it happened and things can, like that. Can I take your analogy a step further? Please. Um, that brings up issues about training the doctor. Um, how do you train the doctor to ask the questions in a way that will elicit the information from you in a way that you're comfortable? Mm -hmm. And if you're unlikely to talk to the doctor about it, is there a way to train the nurses as these intermediaries between the patient yeah. and the doctor so that you can gain in that kind of information? Today's educators are overburdened. They've got all kinds of things going on, but a lot of them don't realize what parents are doing at home to support kids' <laughs> educations in ways that are intentional or unintentional, or the roles that siblings are playing in younger siblings' um, education related to school and more broadly. How we train teachers to recognize and validate those strengths that are within families is a big part of making them feel like what happens outside of the classroom becomes part of the mm -hmm. academic exercise and makes mm -hmm. the academic exercise less academic, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do we make that a meaningful part of teacher training, not just a cultural competence add-on at the end, which is what it usually also mm -hmm. is for doctors? Right, right. Um, how do we make families more comfortable 
engaging, not, if not with schools, then with other trusted partners in the community who can help to translate their experience to educators in ways that make those relationships better than they are. And I know that you know your work you've done with families is with families of younger children. But I'm I'm curious then, Teresa, if, if the way that you're looking at data is something that the parents of your mm -hmm. students know about, use themselves, or if you're at a point where the kids are they're 19, 20, 25 mm -hmm. years old, they've kind of moved on from that, and it's about helping them see what their data <coughs> means and how it affects their education. What we've done is the latter, not saying okay. that the parents' side wouldn't be of value. We just haven't done that um, yet. But what I would um, like to echo something that Dave said earlier. So when our students get here, they are ready for tuition, financial aid, or whatever the case may be. And we did not know till last year, when we started looking at data, looking at midterm, looking at a couple of things, 40% of our students were making C's at midterm. Okay, so like, why 40% of our students making C, freshmen, I'm talking about freshmen. And what happened, we did a survey. And probably 90% of those students hadn't bought books yet. Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -mm. Had, had not, not bought, bought books. books. And, and did you, you probably couldn't say, answer the follow-up, or ask the follow-up, uh, you know. Sure I can. Well, <laughs> but in the data, <laughs> tell me, like, and it, was it affordability only? Were there other issues? So it's it, choices. Was it it's, access? It's, it's choices. So some of the students said, this book is not as important as this book. Um, can I go to the library and get the book? I need it for other things. Mm -hmm. um, first generation students, they need mm -hmm. a little bit of money in their pockets and all that stuff. So from that data, what we did is say, okay, we got to go down two paths because they got to have their books, right? Or they have, have some means of, uh, of getting their um, supporting information for the classrooms. So we went to the bookstore and says, we want a reduction of 40% in books, mm. okay? If you can't do that, your contract is up next year, so then we'll have to talk about that. But um, <laughs> so, so, so they put together a freshman package, which is 40% less, okay? And what we did was we went to the board and said, hey, we want to make this a fee. That will ensure that the students will get their books. But the other parallel path we did is we put a policy in place and says every freshman class, gen ed, has to be in the learning management system. Has mm -hmm. to be. So then students don't get far behind in doing that. So now you have to so flip everything. So for folks who may not know a learning management system, just That's quickly. like on Blackboard like, or your, your doc, your Where you're logging in and you're seeing your, your assignments, service. discussion, homework, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have a union state, and of course the union's like, oh, we don't have to do that. Yes, you do. At least for <laughs> freshmen, because that is the only way we know that they're picking up what they need to do. So we, you have to flip every one of your traditional classes in a learning management s system for the first year. So now we can now track this analytics around this to see mm -hmm. what students are doing. And, you know? and I don't know if any of the textbooks that were kind of part of that process of bringing the costs down were open or not, or you know, if this is, if this is a, a key part for Delaware State, but maybe David, if you could describe a little bit of the, the Z degree, for example, and what that means for students when they come and don't have to be. Hey, yeah, you know, how does well, that work? So. The, the, impact is, um, the impact is that you essentially give every student a $1,000 scholarship. Mm -hmm. Because that's the equivalent. Every student yeah. that comes of, in the door gets, you know, that's in that cost. degree program gets a thousand dollar scholarship mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. now it's one they didn't know they needed, <laughs> in many cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's that's what it amounts to effectively. Right. Um, that first year is so difficult because yeah. it's uh, th they're transitioning. Mm -hmm. College is so different. This idea of general education, like I thought when I got to college, I was finally going to take the classes I cared about, right? Like right. I wanted to be a business major, yes. not be off taking this biology class or whatever it was. And we send, we send this mixed signal that we think students don't pick up on, but they absolutely do, that says, you know, these general education courses are so important that we will not let you graduate if you don't take them. Mm -hmm. And they're so unimportant that the day they're over, just go sell your books back. Right. You never need to think about that again. It's never gonna, you're never gonna need to refer to it again. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, we need a better model around that and a model that uses open educational resources mm -hmm. where not only are they free the first day, 
but I never have to sell them back. I'm never tempted to give them back. I build up a collection of materials that I've marked up and I am familiar with and I can refer to them again later on. This, mm -hmm. this function of building my own personal library uh, is also really mm -hmm. important and not mm -hmm. something that mm -hmm. students are able to do now because that temptation to, do y'all know there are $400 textbooks now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Yes. And, and what would you guess the, the buyback price for those is? <laughs> right? It's like a, a pizza, right? Essentially. Right. That's exactly um, right. And obviously, and just, and just because something's going online doesn't mean that it's any cheaper by any, by any stretch, no. right? No, and not only is it not the, cheaper, but in fact, as it goes online, you see what other many publishers are doing is they're investing in technology, not that makes it easier to share, easier to remix, easier to mash up, but technology that makes it harder mm -hmm. to do any of those kind of internet native activities and they've been very successful at following up uh, those technological measures with legislation that mm -hmm. makes it illegal to circumvent those technological measures mm -hmm. even to make fair uses mm -hmm. to make mm -hmm. other uses that would otherwise be legal just the act of circumventing their controls to do something that would otherwise be legal is illegal mm -hmm. so the investment has been in more control and I know I'm just soapboxing now, so I apologize. <laughs> but no. but it, it feels to me very much like, a, uh, like an attack on the idea of personal property. Mm -hmm. We don't want anyone to own copies of things anymore because if you own a copy of a book, you might resell it. There might be secondary markets that develop. But if I can just lease you for six months yeah. an access yeah. code, right. I can perfectly control what you do. And at the end of the day, you've paid all your money. And on you know, January 1st, you have literally nothing mm -hmm. to show for it. So just to play devil's advocate for a moment here, from, the, from a publisher's point of view, is, is there not a, a, a real crunch financially to be creating print materials and having to kind of figure out all these digital platforms and doing it in ways that match, say, common core standards or that um, are aligned with what, what colleges are expecting? Um, and have you seen models that where publishers are able to say, no, we, we can make this work financially, but in a more open way? Uh, so I feel like I'm talking too much. Um, I, I think the only thing I'll say there is you can really feel the whole system kind of rattling as, mm -hmm. as companies try to hold on to 20th century business mm -hmm. models. Mm -hmm as mm -hmm. the world moves yep. forward. Yeah. And will, it be, is, will that transition be painful? Yes. yes. And will we lose some of them? Yes. Mm -hmm. But we just need to bite the bullet and make that business model transition. Um, yeah, everybody knows the story about the ice delivery man and how the ice delivery man was put out of business by the refrigerator in the house eventually. <laughs> There's that kind of transition coming transition. and dragging it out isn't helping anybody. And those models are just forcing things underground. I teach at Rutgers University, which is the state university of New Jersey. Half of our students are first generation college goers uh, and they face all these same issues. And I've had conversations with students that I don't want you choosing between eating and reading yes. and exactly. you're going to read. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'll figure out ways to do that. I have internal, you know, like the programs where kids will donate their books to me mm -hmm. if I have to have a textbook, like for research mm -hmm. methods. If they don't need it at the end of the semester, donate it to me instead of getting the 20 bucks at the mm -hmm. bookstore, and I'll give it to another student the next semester who can't afford it. Um, but I shouldn't be doing that. Um, or, or and I'm probably that have violating your rules. Now, right? <laughs> yeah, and and, op yeah. and open the the, food, the halls on on the weekends to give you know food away that they haven't used during the week. We shouldn't be there. So, um, and this is making me think too, uh, Teresa, that the data that you're um, collecting and looking at for each student can, it, not only are you able to kind of see what students' needs are and whether they're maybe mm -hmm. hitting some of these barriers, mm -hmm. but you also, I suppose, can, can then open up conversations about what, why, why that C in midterm, why are you mm -hmm. um, struggling at this moment, um, and that that can perhaps carry that conversation forward for yeah. those students? So, um, you know, as always, layers and layers of da uh, data, and so that was the first conversation is, well, they don't have books. Mm -hmm. Didn't know, honestly did not know that. So we, we did start a, um, went to the board of trustees, said, hey, use your scholarship for book scholarships. You know, students have to have books. Um, but the second thing, so we got that straight, and we'll look at the yields, because 
if they get their books, they were probably 80 or so percent end up with a BA towards the end of the semester. That's why it didn't make sense, right? So like, what are you doing C or last year, but you end up mm, making a B or A. But um, the other thing we started doing is segmenting the sections who we're teaching, because it's just not all the students, so right? Mm -hmm. So when I look over here, and you have the same class as you, hear, you have here, and 25% of the students are passing in this class, but 20, I mean, 75 are passing here, but 75 are failing here. Let's have another conversation. With that conversation, I just nicely hand over to academics, because <laughs> they, they're in a different world than I am. So I nicely hand that over to give them data about Really, we're here for student success. So this data is, this, there's outliers here. Why? Right, right. You know, why does the student struggle? Because next semester, they're going to go take the same class mm -hmm. and end up passing. But what happens is they end up graduating with 148, 50 credit hours instead of the 120 mm -hmm. that they're assigned, which adds on another year to their graduation. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we just right. kind of look at everything we can to try to start making informed decisions and strategies and then interventions around those. So to close out, and before we get to our last polling question, just really quick, um, if you could, say what, what is one thing that right now gives you the most hope that we can build a better social contract for education and technology? For me, it's the IDP, because that's, I can tell where a student is, what a student doing, have they been advised, that, you know, that is my hope that at any time if we say we, the retention drops off, I'll know exactly where, when, why, and how, and then okay. we can make those decisions. So that is what I think is the answer the to what we need. Individualized The ind individual mm -hmm, for DSU. Great. Uh, for me, I think it's the groundswell around digital equity that's happening at the moment. We've got, you know, HUD working on Connect Home. We've got the president's announcement of Connect All, the changes to the FCC's Lifeline policy, um, all these organizations and groups that are working locally to try to provide the kinds of supports families need to engage um, and manage, you know, their skills. I think where we still need help is recognizing what strengths these families are already have mm -hmm. um, and leveraging those strengths as partners for the kinds of changes they want to see for their families and their communities because we're so used to looking at these families by their deficits in income in education and mm -hmm. so forth let's start focusing on their strengths and make them partners for this but i'm hopeful about the groundswell and recognition that's happening at the moment at different levels related to really uh, working towards digital equity yeah, and I think I'd say something similar. I think that the word is really getting out about the impact of the cost of educational materials. Mm -hmm. The word is getting out about the existence of open educational resources. There are literally over a billion of them by our last count available online. Um, these uh, OER degree programs are growing. Uh, the Department of Education is running a great campaign right now called Go, with the hashtag Go Open. Um, there's just lots of people joining forces and helping move this work forward, and it looks like, um, you know, all the early indicators are that it, it's going very well, and it looks like it has momentum to go quite a distance. Great. So the reason, reasons for both excitement and concern, I can hear. <laughs> we're going to put up our last question, and um, as, we, as you're answering it, I'll tell you a little bit about where we're going to go forward in the education policy program with these questions. Um, in this issue, but we wanted to just get a sense of actually after some of what you've heard this morning, what you may have already known coming in, if there are certain things you want to do it locally within your own community that um, help kind of push some of these issues mm -hmm. around equity uh, and responsibility. So um, we've got up here everything from talking to say a school board member or your college um, to understanding better who really has access to the internet in your community um, and uh, access to open uh, educational resources as well. Um, we, are, we, are, we are excited about these issues. I think there is a groundswell within the Learning Technologies Project over the next couple of months. We're going to be continuing to explore this uh, with blog posts, um, snippets from the conversation today, and um, we can continue the conversation as well on Twitter using the its personal hashtag. And, um, and we'll close out for now, but please join me in thanking our great panel. Thank you.